on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We recap everything we saw in OU Spring Game, and then we give you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hostie will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Sunday, April 21st, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of April, all you got to do is visit Riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. No injuries, Ted. Let's go. Yeah, that's a spring game win right there for sure. Absolutely. Now, we're going to break it down like we do the games. So let's start on the defensive side of the ball. Ted, what did you think? I thought, well, it, it gets it gets difficult to evaluate like the overall product because um, you got you got twos and threes and ones kind of intermixed, but all in all, I thought I saw, you know, plenty of good stuff out there to build on. Um, I, I thought maybe the defensive line was the strong point. Saw some really nice things. Grayson Holton had a nice day. Jaden Jackson looked really good out there. Devon Sears had a nice day. Um, it, it just shows you how different this defense is going to be if our Mason Thomas is able to stay healthy and have a full run of it in the fall. We haven't really, he's been the best pass rusher on the team now for several years, and we haven't seen him able to have a full season, a full run of it healthy. If, if he could be healthy and stay healthy for this fall, it's going to be a game changer for us, especially on passing downs. Um, we had a really good pass rush. They ran some nice games on the interior. Some of those little tackle twists between Jaden Jackson and Grayson Holton were really, really nicely executed. Um, I thought all of that looked really good. Um, I thought the backers showed pretty well. Stutzman only played a little bit, as as we figured, uh, but he was clean, as you would expect. And then, uh, uh, like we've been talking about, big rotation of guys. I mean, they've got multiple guys that you could rotate in and play. You know, I like the the Kobe McKenzie and Kip Lewis. Uh, that grouping does pretty good. You've got Kobe McKenzie, who's the big thumper, really good in the box. I thought he had some nice spots in zone coverage out there. Kip Lewis is your downhill aggressive guy that can run sideline to sideline. And then Lewis Carter, you know, I I was expecting that he was going to have you know, some type of moment where he blew somebody up. It's just kind of how he typically plays and, and what you see in practice. But, you know, he looks solid out there, as you would expect. So um, I thought the backers overall were good. There was some stuff, you know, there was there was a couple missed tackles. There was some misfits. They misfits fit a run a couple of times. But all in all, I thought the, the backers were pretty solid. And, man, the safeties – I, we had some breakdowns in the secondary. There's no doubt, but I love the way our guys tackle. Robert Spears Jennings, uh, Boganowski coming up and making a bunch of tackles. Uh, they they looked really good for the most part in space, coming from depth, coming up and, and fitting up running backs, fitting up uh, wide receivers in the short flat. Thought. For the most part, we looked really good tackling. There were some moments, of course, but you know our offense is going to make some plays on you. But overall, I I thought it was really solid. What was up with the busts in the secondary? Because we've heard a, a lot about the depth in the back in the defense, and clearly Billy Bowman's not out there. I, I don't expect those types of mistakes to happen when he is on the field, but. You're letting what 
might be the best player on the team just run uncovered down the middle of the football field. Yeah. That's yeah, stuff you just them... you can't have, you know, those are you got to make the offense work for it. Those are those are just gimme like you're just handing it to them. That that yeah. was I don't know how alarmed to be by that, but it happened it happened way too often. Well, one of them was like, I think we're in a cover three and cover three can be tough for verticals. And like, what you want is your underneath guys to take speed off or reroute guys to where they don't just have a full steam run right up the seam because, you know, the way the route progressions work, like a corner may have to read something happen before he gets on top of that seam route or safety may have to read something before he gets over on top of it. So what you want is the underneath guys to reroute them either by body position where they have to run around you or just go out there and punch them. It's in the NFL. You can touch guys after five yards, go out there, put your hands on them and take some speed off it to help your, your secondary guys. One of those was, um, uh, that situation to cover three, we didn't take any speed off. And then, the other one I think was a Tampa, you know, where, you know, you got two high safeties and the Mike linebacker basically runs the middle third. Um, you know, you just run a straight vertical down the field and, you know, you hope to keep positioning on the receiver and you know, make that throw difficult, at least to where they have to put air under the ball to help the safety. Who's a half field to get over and help you make a play on it. And I think we may have, open to the wrong way, which, you know, I don't know what the rules say. Typically in Tampa, you open to number three or you open to speed. I'm always open to the fast guy on the field. And that was, that was Burke. So uh, you got to open and get depth right away and try and stay on top of it as long as you can. And, you know, some of those things are just, they're, they're going to happen. Um, it's a good learning experience for everyone involved. And, you know, other than giving up a couple of those, I thought they did a really good job on the running quarterbacks. You know, you saw one where Stutzman came up on Hawkins in a ton of space. And, you know, we were talking about on the broadcast, I, Stutzman doesn't make that play two years ago for sure, maybe even last year. He's so confident and under control and understands his leverage and where his help is. It was just the easiest play you could imagine for him. It looked really good. And, you know, I thought I thought we did a really good job containing with the rush for the most part. And then whenever those guys did break contain, kind of closing the distance, spreading the net to where they didn't make any huge chunks on us. They converted some first downs, but no one really got out the gate on us. So I thought that was pretty good. Were there any guys that surprised you that really flashed as you were watching it? I I really liked Boganowski's aggressiveness coming up from depth from that safety how, spot. how do you think Bauer Sharp feels about Boganowski's aggressiveness yeah yeah he was uh he was all over the, he was he was on the verge of like yeah this is a spring game but come on you know let's uh let's take care of our guys which hey how about Bates going up and charging him up after that one I liked it go yeah. defend your guy I I was saying the same thing on the sideline He's like the only tight end we got, bro. What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I I just, I like that aggressiveness. It's like when you're young and it's a big moment, this is sometimes overlooked and it's not as easy as you think, but you have to learn how to practice, you know, and, and there's a time to take that shot and there's a time not to, but as a young guy, like you kind of have to learn that, and then you learn when to pull off a he, little bit. But I liked what I saw from him. He he looked around, kind of like, what what did I do? What <laughs> what? Well, that's what I'm supposed to do. It was it was just a it was a funny moment. Now, I I really liked what I saw from him. The only I think the only big mistake that I think he made was on Deion Burks's first touchdown. He's looking down at the call sheet when the ball is snapped. And I don't know if he was supposed to carry him. You know, he's wide open running down the field. I don't know if he was supposed to carry him or not, but the ball is snapped and his head is down looking at 
looking at the call sheet. Yeah, well, not Which, good. Not what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I thought I thought the young guy, I mean, just in general, the amount of young players, first-year guys, second-year guys that are rotating through and giving you really good snaps, I think, is, is just, it's really promising. When you think about the guys up on the defensive line, you know, throw Lewis Carter in there, um, throw PJ in there. I thought PJ uh, actually looked pretty good at times. And then the secondary guys, uh, Reggie Powers, uh, Boganowski, Jaden Hardy. I mean, there's a bunch of guys that are giving you some really solid snaps. What did you think about the tackling? Field was in perfect condition. Rain held off. It was great football weather. What what do you think about what you saw from a tackling perspective? Didn't seem like there was a bunch of whiffs, like swings and misses. Yeah, there was a you know Caleb Hicks had a couple, but you know we'll get to him. Um, you know what, Jacoby Johnson had a bad one, but I, he was lined up wrong, so he had way too much space that he was trying to trying to track down. That wasn't a good one. I thought. I thought for the most part, the tackling was, was pretty sharp. Now it's just, it's interesting that I, how far the defense has come as a, as an overall unit in the last couple of years, because I we're grading them way more, way tougher than we would have previously. And that's a good thing. Um, I, again, I, I coming from depth and you got to remember Billy Bowman wasn't out there at safety and, Stutzman didn't play a whole lot, so a lot of your best tacklers didn't didn't play most of the time. So, considering that, I thought it was pretty good. Schematically, as vanilla as it could have been, what all yeah. four down? Did we see a single snap of three down defense or them get in the bare front with the Mike Backer walked up on the edge? It was all straight four two five. Uh, two inside backers and then the cheetah position on the field. I, I can't recall a single snap of three down defense. No, which I mean, hidden in there tells you how good our defense is. I mean, they didn't pressure, they didn't change fronts. They didn't, they didn't change angles and bring different guys. I mean, they played it as base as you could. And, you know, which is good. Like, I like that. I, I think the best defense is played in in base packages and then you sprinkle in the other stuff and you know I whenever you really get this defense has all their starters out there and you're changing fronts and you're stemming fronts and you're give her different looks and you're bringing pressures and you're running man pressures and fire zones and all of that stuff like they're going to be really really good I thought that R. Mason Thomas, uh, out of all the edge guys, flashed the most. Uh, He got Jake Taylor with that inside move multiple times. Mm -hmm. And he's got that thread of the speed up the field, and he's developing a really nice counter coming underneath. And said, you know, when when you make that move, when you counter inside, you better get there. Got to win. You got to win, and he did. You got to win or you got to tell someone to cover you, you know, like, in, and it turns into a natural. If you're going to, if you're going to try and go on the inside, you got to let someone know so they can kind of swing out and cover that, that contained spot. So yeah, but if he gets that down, I, I mean, it's like to be a great pitcher, you could be great with a, a great fastball and a great change up. And, you know, there's a lot of other cute stuff in there, but if you can get the command on those two, you're going to be really good. And it's the same thing as a pass rusher. You've got your go-to move and then you've got your counter and just work with it. I thought Ethan Downs looked about as athletic as I can remember him looking. He looked fast, didn't he? He looked, he looked as fluid as I can remember him looking like his foot speed looked good. I know that they've been, you know, he's been kind of searching for that sweet spot when it comes to his weight and what's he, what he wants to play at. I thought he looked strong as hell and his feet were moving really well. So I, I think maybe he finally found it. It took a while, but it, it seems like he's, he's found that sweet spot, Ted. I agree. And you know, 
it also helps that he's he's so experienced now. He's playing with much better pad level, and he's got a good base under him with his feet. So whenever he does disengage, I there was a couple of plays where they tried to gain the edge on us and run around the corner, and they couldn't get there, and he was able to shut it down. And I think you're right. I think it's foot speed. I think he's at the right playing weight, but he's also in a good position technique-wise to be able to disengage and have your feet in the proper spot where you're not crossing over yourself to try and get back out to get to the outside. He was, uh, he was in really good positioning and which, you know, I thought was, was good just overall for the defense. Uh, we had a couple trace Ford had one where we let it get out of contain, but for the most part, it was really hard to gain the edge for the offense, uh, against our, our edge guys. PJ, I thought he used his length. Well, Clearly had some impact plays in, in the spring game. I will say this. I think the next step for him and maybe the biggest emphasis, they they have got to get him more flexible. He uh, There are multiple snaps where it looks like he's got Tarquin beat, but he can't quite bend. And you know how the best pass rushers are. They have that natural ability to bend and shorten that corner even more. And he is getting to his spot and winning. Like he is beating the tackle to that spot, but he doesn't have quite the flexibility or the bend to shorten that corner and be there a step, step and a half earlier than he's getting there, which that's the difference between sacking the quarterback and not. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know if it's his hips. I don't know if it's kind of his, his his midsection, but that needs to be a big point of emphasis for him is like working on that bend. And I, I'm not sure how much you can train that. A lot of guys just have it. Like the, the, the top tier type pass rushers just have that bend. But if they can get him to bend a little better, he's winning the battle to the spot. He's just got to be able to bend that corner a little better. And, dude, he could be – I mean, yeah. he could be an absolute stud as a pass rusher. I just noticed it. I noticed it like four or five times. Yeah, well, one of his biggest assets is his length, right? We talk about that a ton. But, you know, there's – you know, with, with every strength, there's also a kind of a counter to that. And when you've got really long legs – it makes it more difficult to bend the corner and run the edge, run the hoop. You know, shorter guys naturally can bend more and lean way further. So, like, to me, like, flexibility, his his core strength, you know, hip mobility, all of that. But, the like, the most important thing is learning how to use your cleats as tools. Like, to be able to not slip out, to get the body lean and the body edge it's, you know, a lot of those guys, they end up out there and they catch the side of their cleats and they slip out. So there's like a fear of getting that real, that, that turn to you. Right. So it's just, to me, it's a combination of, of the athleticism, learning it, getting used to it, getting in those tough, tough positions and really focusing how, on how to keep your traction and dig your cleats into the ground. Anything but else I, I'm with you? Yeah. I, I, I was encouraged by what we saw, but I think there's, and he's still, he's still so young, but there's clearly another level where he can get to as a pass rusher, even this season. Like, I think he can make that, that improvement throughout the summer, like really focus on it. And if he can get that bend around the corner, then all of a sudden a counter inside move becomes, mm -hmm. A tackle's that, worst nightmare. That long arm, yeah. and then transition it to an inside move. Yeah, because yeah. you're you're afraid of getting beat with the speed and the bend on the outside, and that's in the back of your head every time the ball's being snapped in pass protection, and then all of a sudden he throws an inside move on you, and uh-oh, that's yeah. where that's where you can end up in a blender as an as an <laughs> offensive lineman. But yeah, any anything else? I kind of a quiet day for the corners. I mean, when you think about the big plays throughout throughout the spring game, it was mostly Burks uncovered down in the middle of the field. Eli Bowen looked pretty good out there. 
Yeah. And he's the guy that Coach Venables talked about. They can play at corner. They can play at cheetah. They can play him at safety. And, you know, size-wise, you know, he's a little smaller, but he makes up for it in reaction time and quickness. He was he was all over a lot of those shorter routes where they were trying to run little comebacks and stuff. I thought he looked really good. Um, corner's going to be competitive. I really like the size we've got with Des Malone and Kanai Walker out, out there. Both those guys like 6'2 or close to it um, looking really good. There's, it's going to be – if we get – if we end up getting top-level corner play, I mean, to me, that's kind of like the last – I mean, interior D line and a corner player, like the last two check marks. And I got to tell you, I, I know you watch the, the interior quite a bit. I, I know we're not just big and overwhelming physically in the interior, but end up looking pretty salty. Didn't it? I, I spent most of my time on the sideline telling Dominic Williams, he needs to come to Oklahoma. (laughs) <laughs> nice i i i don't feel worse about the interior defensive line after that now and this is we'll we'll discuss it i was pretty surprised at how effective the zone combinations were for the interior of the offensive line against the defensive line mm-hmm. i i think they could have ran inside zone variations for 250 yards if they wanted to mm-hmm. i mean that, that that first group especially Bates. We woo and Sexton, they did a really nice job in the interior of they weren't just blowing guys off the ball, but they were covering up. They had a hat on a hat and and you saw some of the successful runs and they weren't doing anything overly complicated. Yeah. So I, I actually, and, and that was against the second defensive line. So it's kind of hard to tell, but those guys are going to play snaps for you. And they were not splitting double teams at all. Like when you think about when that first offensive line was running the football, very few, if any, zero or negative yard runs. Yeah. Which is a good thing. But yep. this just goes back to what we always say. If you can upgrade the roster, right. you, uh, it, if Dominic Williams wants to come to Oklahoma, need that guy. Clear a path. <laughs> he is, his back is rather wide. <laughs> I mean, he's not very <laughs> tall, man, but he he does not look like a fun guy to block. I stood right next no. to him and went, hmm, that doesn't look like a fun time. No, not at all. Yeah, that, if if they can pull that off, that's going to be a game changer. Yeah, the, it seems there is uh, quite the uh, quite the bidding war going on for that young man. Hopefully, Hopefully Oklahoma can win that one. But you got anything else with what you saw from the defense? Overall, really solid. I like, last thing, I like the dynamic of Zach Alley being there for Venables. You know, just, he was still out there working it. He was having some extended conversation with some with some players between series and between uh, snaps at times. But I think it it gives Brent Venables the ability to go dial in on smaller details with guys instead of being wrapped up in the big picture of everything on, on defense. So, uh, I think you get, I think you end up getting way more out of your head coach. That's good. Love hearing that. You mentioned the corners. This is the last thing we got a chance to be huge in the secondary. I know it. Now Bowman Bowman's not the biggest guy, but his explosiveness, like he plays big. Yeah. But it makes me wonder, like, if you're going to roll with Des Malone and Kanai Walker at corner, if you're if those are your two corners, it screams zone coverage football team. Yeah, to me, when yep. you're talking about playing to those guys' strengths, using their length. Now, of course, you're going to have to mix in some man coverage principles uh, at times, but. If they can become a really, really good zone coverage team with that length in the back end, that's mm-hmm. gets you a little excited, Ted. It does. No, it it really does. And Coach Venables likes, you know, the quarter quarter half stuff where you can roll guys up, and when you've got a a six two two hundred and five pound corner that's rolled up as a flat player that can help in run support and 
And then, you know, it's hard it's hard to throw those like the China seven stuff behind a guy that's six two. You know, it can become really difficult. And, you know, we're big at safety, as you mentioned. Robert Spears Jennings has got great length, great athleticism. So yeah, I I I think we're we got a chance to be really good defensively. I like it. All right, let's talk about what we saw on the offensive side of the ball in the spring game. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Love's Connect app unlocks exclusive deals can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, Be sure to download the Love's Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Love's Travel Stops. Love's also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamori. And celebrate with a Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop L Works, named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score. You can join in on the celebration with an ice cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletic Events, at the bar, at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All American Ale, visit schoonerale.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All American Ale, the taste of game day. And we love simple modern. Simple Modern is an Oklahoma-owned drinkware company who launched the best cups it's ever made this month with its new signature line. They're 100% leak-proof, which is what everyone needs with an on-the-go cup, and it has a ceramic coating on the top of double-insulated stainless steel to preserve the beverage's taste while still keeping it cold and hot for hours. And even better, Simple Modern exists to give generously, donating 10% of all profits. So you can know. You're helping better Oklahoma and beyond with every purchase. Check it all out at simplemodern.com today. Offense. You want to just do it how we normally do it during the season, position by position? Go, yeah. Conversation always starts with quarterback. Thought Jackson Arnold was solid. Uh, There were a couple situations where... If he is going to decide to throw the football in the RPO game, you have to throw the football. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to point to a snap where Bauer Sharp and Jake Taylor both get beat. It looked awful. It's like an inside zone RPO concept. He doesn't hand it. Ball's got to be gone. Bauer Sharp's blocking the run on that play. And if you're blocking inside zone and the defensive end jumps around your outside, it's exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to hold on to that, you got to throw it. But thought Jackson Arnold looked good, man. Didn't make any critical errors with the football. I thought, uh, I thought that he showed good athleticism. He, He did. They didn't run him a lot, but in that one read run around the edge looked good. He is noticeably thicker to me in person, like standing next to him on the sideline. Looks like he's had a really good, off season in the weight room so far. I thought he looked solid, Ted. I, I don't have really m- many complaints other than if, if you're not going to hand it in some of that RPO stuff, you got to get rid of the football. You can't, you cannot take those big time negative plays. If it's not there, just throw it away. Yeah, no, I'm with you. The, some, some of the timing stuff on, on getting it out a little bit quicker. Um, I thought, you know, you whenever you look at his numbers, what was what is ten to twenty? Is that what it was? I think that that's what I saw. Ten to twenty for two thirty three, right. two touchdowns. But uh, you can look at that and say completed fifty percent of his passes. A lot of those were throwaways or throw it to where only the offensive guy has the chance of making it. He did not put the ball in harm's way, and I think that's the most important thing you want from your quarterback. So I know that completion percentage doesn't just jump off the charts at you, but it it doesn't tell the whole story. I thought he was really good with the football making decisions. It was oddly refreshing watching him overthrow Deion Burks on that one long ball. 
yeah, he's got arm arm in reserve to be able to really push it out there. I I kind of I agree with that. And it was overthrown by like six inches. It was close, but it was overthrowing the deep ball has not been an issue for the last couple no. seasons. And no. I, for some odd reason, it brought a smile to my face. I don't know why. <laughs> it was, I was like, that was a great incompletion. But it, any other thoughts on what you saw from from Jackson? Eleven looks good on him. Good looking looks number. Good, good looking quarterback number. I I thought, I thought you know, with 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 Michael Hawkins coming in and how athletic he is, I feel like the conversation. I just went straight to that. And I, I think just generally a lot of people forgot how athletic Jackson Arnold is. Like, you could say what you want about Dylan Gabriel. Experience, like, he was really good. But Jackson Arnold is a massive upgrade athletically over Dylan Gabriel running the football. And Dylan Gabriel was good running the football. So um, I, I thought he looked really good, ran around the corner, athletic he's going to be like whenever it's in an actual game and there's tough yards to get like you mentioned bigger fit like more physical thicker he's going to be tough to bring down in those moments too the defense kept it vanilla from a coverage standpoint it we'll only know once the season gets started of how he reacts to the picture changing after the ball is snapped yeah Right. That that's usually the issue for for young quarterbacks is you get your read pre-snap, the picture changes. How do you process that information quickly? So what he didn't get a lot of those scenarios from what I could tell in the spring game, but overall a nice performance. Thought Michael Hawkins was under a lot of pressure throughout the day. Yeah. Had a few throws. He did have, especially early, a few throws where you saw that arm strength. I mean, it was he, he had an early out route where that thing was humming. And even he just threw like a little bubble to pet away where he didn't, he barely even moved his feet and kind of just flicked it to him. And you could just see the the velocity on the football. I he he didn't have many explosive plays, but you saw flashes of why. The coaching staff is so excited about him. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. Um, you know, the, I think he threw a couple of comebacks on the outside too, and you know, there's no wind up to get it out there. It's just his back foot hits the ground, and it's just like a little little whip, and he's he's got a ton of velocity on it, and you know, the athleticism is there, and he's got he's got that really nice spin out, you know, where he spins back out whenever he can sense that defensive end, maybe caving in a little bit on him. Um, yeah, I, not a lot of complaints. It was really tough on him at times where he, he hardly had time to get set up before the entire D-line was caving in on him. So it made it really difficult to evaluate. But you saw him get outside a couple of times and use his legs, and he, he's going to be dangerous. I completely agree. Now, he was... He was under a lot of pressure, but I'll give the guy credit. Didn't make any catastrophic mistakes with the football. Yeah. Which I, I think that that's, that's a positive wide receiver. Deion Burks looks really good. <laughs> now I know he is on several of them. He's just running wide open uncovered which still blows my mind from OU's defense but e even the ones where he is covered you can just see how much speed and how explosive he is and said this was something we talked about on the broadcast I don't know the last guy that's looked as explosive as he looks for OU uh, people want to say Hollywood Brown I He's com he's built completely different They're than Hollywood different Brown. Different players, yeah, different players. He's, you know, Hollywood. You if you would hit him on the right route and he had some space, forget about it. He's going to take it to the house. But and and like I'm not suggesting that Hollywood doesn't have like quick burst, 
he clearly he does, but I know what you're saying. He's he's just got he's, he's got more like, like a juice a, to him. He's got he's got the long speed, right? Just the straight line, but he also has that Sterling Shepherd like stop and start. Yeah. Where he can stop and start and shift gears, but then be at full speed quickly. I, I don't know. He's He's the most excited I've been for a wide receiver around here in a while. I it agree. just is. Yep. And I love I love the spot that he's in because you you can get him the ball so easily in a bunch of different ways. We saw him running seam routes down the middle. We saw him running those those over routes that are hell on the secondary when you have a guy of his speed that's screaming across the formation. You can get him the ball on the bubbles. He's going to be getting the ball a lot on the RPO stuff. So, yeah, he's he's going to be a big, big piece of our offense, and I love it. Had a 64-yard touchdown, a 50-yard touchdown, and should have had the overthrow would have been a 69-yard touchdown. Nice. Those were great, but my favorite play of the day was the over route you mentioned. He catches it, and then what does he do? He doesn't get on the ground. Doesn't lay down. He runs Can I Walker over. Yeah. And then turns and lets him know about it. And I was just like, I love this guy so much. Yeah. He's he's just got uh he's got an energy to him, doesn't he? The the touchdown dance and you know, the interview with playing. He's just he came and did an interview at our our radio station and it's just it's energy, it's good vibes, he's got a just a good feeling about him. He's going to be a fan favorite this year. Oh, there's no doubt about it. And clearly was the star of the spring game. No other wide receiver other than Burks really had any splash plays. Jaden Gibson, he had the touchdown that was called back for the offensive pass interference. But other than that, the rest of the group just kind of quiet. Which when Burks is going off the way that he was going off, okay, it is what it is. But yeah, really not a really no other explosive plays. Yeah, I liked the you know carry on looked pretty good at times running some of those comeback routes with with the size that he has, um, you know. But not seeing Anderson and Farouk out there, it kind of it kind of changes what that dynamic's going to look like. But um, yeah, no, I I agree. No one else really just jumped out as a, a guy that you've got to get more more opportunities to so throw it to number six <laughs> no doubt but just got to get that group healthy Anderson didn't play Farouk didn't play uh, Brennan Thompson didn't play so uh, I'm sure that is priority number one for the wide receiver group is just get get all those guys healthy and, and ready to go for the season running back thought the group as a whole looked solid mm-hmm Thought Sawchuck looked as healthy and powerful as I've seen him look. It, it's clear to me that Caleb Hicks has the most twitch in tight spaces of the group. But I, I, I thought Sam Franklin played played faster than I thought he could. Agreed. I think he's he's a little light. I think he needs to add, you know, like five to eight more pounds of good weight. But Ted thought the group as a whole ran it well, never put it on the ground, finished. Finished runs physically. I, I I don't have many complaints, man. Yeah, I you know I thought there's like the there's a fine line. You want your guys to run aggressive and angry and and downhill, but you you don't want to just sell out. Like you want to be under control, and that's kind of what I thought of Sawchuck. I thought he he looked confident, under control, and smooth while at the same time looking fast and aggressive. He was like right in that sweet spot. And I I really thought they all were, you know, whenever you you start to get too aggressive, you're leaving meat on the bone to go try and run through somebody whenever you can maybe skate to the outside. So I thought everyone made really good decisions. I thought Hick, I really like how Hicks in that, that split zone, he keeps his shoulders square so he can, he can cut back. He can do that little, little jump cut that he's got and it makes him harder to tackle. You can't ever really get a good shot on him. It's all 
hard surface area to tackle. It's, you know, the top of his shoulder pads or his knees. You don't get any soft spots. So, yeah, I, I thought I thought the group looked pretty good. The one thing about Hicks, he's never – when he's getting tackled, he's never going backwards. Yeah. Like, he doesn't get – you you always talk about knockback tackles, like not getting drugged. He was – you know, he was never getting hit and, like, knocked sideways. He was always finishing, getting tackled, falling forward, which – Every little inch in this game matters, man. And that was, it's just, it's really encouraging to see him progressing the way that he is. It's what, it's what you want to see from a young back. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Carrying the football for those guys. I thought everyone did a really good job. Now, like we talked about, you didn't get a bunch of pressures and where the running backs are making decisions on, on who they've got in the blitz pickup game and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's still to some degree a mystery and see who wins out and who could be the most reliable there. But as far as carrying the football, I thought they all looked pretty good. Yeah. I think the only pressure you really got was a simple edge pressure. And there were a couple of those and they were in a full slide concept and the picture could not be clearer for running back. Hey, that's your guy. And and they, they did well in those situations and clearly they weren't cutting at all, which, I don't think DeMarco's a big fan of cutting in pass protection anyways. But one thing I did notice, and, and I think it's more of, you know, it tells the story kind of more of the offensive line situation than the running back situation is they kept the back in a lot in pass protection where he's just kind of scanning, trying to find work. And I think the next step is to develop that trust in the offensive line to where, Hey, you check your one or two guys that you're scanning for in protection, and then you get out. You you saw it. Jackson Arnold moves the pocket and just dumps it down to Sawchuck there on the the north you know north end of the field, and you're getting a big chunk gain just from the simplest dump down to a back. The more you can get that back out, the more it stresses a defense. Yep. And that that's that that's where they need to progress, and, and I think that will come as they develop more of a trust in that offensive line situation. Yep. Um, I agree. And and like when you build on that, those little dump downs to running backs, they chew up a defense and the defensive mindset is like, Oh my God, they're gashing us. We can't let them check it down to the running back. So what happens? You defense ends up getting way more aggressive really than they need to. And that's whenever you can take advantage of stuff because they're trying to stop a check down, which, you know, that's just gives the offense more leverage. Tied in. Bauer Sharp's a tough dude. We found that out for sure. Boganowski <laughs> lit him up and what he was back on the field on punt team, like two plays after he just got decleated. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he's. He's av- as advertised, you know, I thought he, I thought he did a good job on some of that insert stuff and some of the split zone stuff going to block the edge guys. He's tough. I mean, he's, I I don't, it's, I still wouldn't say it's the strong part of his game necessarily, no. but he's, he's a step up from, you know, Stogner was like, it was totally not what he was good at. And he ended up doing a pretty solid job. Bauer Sharp's a lot better as a insert in split zone blocker. Yeah. We didn't get to see him really do anything with the football in his hands, but thought he did a solid job in the run game. He's not a dominant blocker, but he's willing and he, he mixes it up. He's physical. Do we have another tight end? Jake Roberts is over there on the scooter. Mm -hmm. Fanuel just, is he a guy that can play tight end in the SEC? I I don't know. Devon Mitchell looks not, not ready. ready. Cade McIntyre, I, I don't even consider him a tight end. I like him. He's just a he's a tweener between a wide receiver and a tight end right now. He's I mean, they had him, him in the box. Yeah, not to be too critical of him, but we all saw what Kobe McKenzie did to him when they ran the insert play, right? Yep. That was it was not a good matchup. So I just 
I, I know we're excited about Bauer Sharp and that that position, that tight end position was definitely a weak point of the roster a season ago. But I was looking around during the spring game going, is it just Bauer Sharp? And they were in 11 personnel the entire scrimmage. I, I just don't know. Like, are they going to be limited by what they can do offensively because they don't have – you need three. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure they got three, Ted. You're hoping Jake Roberts bounces back and you've got your two. But I, I'm not sure they have that third guy. I mean, it's between what? Helms and – Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, Helms – which you know he's he hasn't been available at all since he's been on campus so i don't know how much stock you can put in that hopefully he gets there because he's a he's an athletic dude um and then Cade mcintyre you could do some stuff with him but he's just so he's just so small and not he, they really like him in the pass game he's really good in the pass game but doesn't have a whole lot of versatility he's one of those guys just you've got a section on your play sheet You've got these eight plays for him, and don't ask him to do stuff he's not good at. Right. Now, does the defense have a good idea of what's going on when he's out on the field then? Yeah, maybe. But he just does not have the size right now to be in the box, especially in the in the SEC. He just doesn't. Yep. So the tight end situation is interesting. I, I was – yeah, I was I was contemplating that as I was down there on the sideline. Like, okay, what – where are we at tight end wise? Offensive line. They ran stretch a couple times and I about cried, Ted. <laughs> they didn't run it particularly well, but they ran it and I, I I was getting emotional down there. It was just, it was good to see a little more variety when it comes to trying to stress the defense, uh, stretching them laterally, getting downhill, did some, did some nice things, but Overall run game was very, very vanilla. Uh, inside zone, inside zone, split zone, the insert play. Uh, they ran the GY counter a couple times. We will looks good as that first puller on the counter concept. But I, I thought, especially the interior of the offensive line, I went back and watched every single run. And the inside zone variation their their combinations on all those plays, they were really good, man. Came together well, moving the down guy. Now, not blowing them off the ball like five or six yards or anything like that. This isn't this isn't a fantasy land. This is real life football. But just good timing coming off on the second level. And I think that's why you saw them have so much success just running those simple zone concepts is those interior combinations were really, really solid. Yeah, I, I, I agree that there was, and, and I don't know if it's a, if it's been a coaching difference or if it's just the personnel. But you know, one of the things that a, a frustration level that we had last year with the run game was the melt off the ball for the run game and. You know, maybe it's because of the RPO stuff. I'm not sure, but there was there was plenty of times. You're right. It's not like they were just a wave blowing people off the ball, but there was some burst and there was movement, and it looked good. Thought Sexton looked pretty good at guard. I think it's kind of a strange position for a guy with his measurables, but he looked really comfortable. I didn't think his height was. A big issue. There are a couple snaps here and there where pad level's a little too high, but overall thought he used his length like his length can be a weapon in the interior. Thought thought he did a nice job. Liked what I saw from Josh Bates. You know, it has been, you know, spring did not get off to a good start for him. And he's gotten better. And I thought he played a very nice spring game. Uh, you know, it wasn't dominant, but thought he did a good job with leading the group as a whole, having everyone on the same page, right? I thought they targeted the right guys in the run game, targeted the proper guys in protection. He was much better anchoring in pass protection. That's the most bend I've seen him play with, and, and that was encouraging. But 
hopefully it's a confidence booster for him. I think they will still still try to upgrade at the position. Uh, I think they will, but I, I liked what I saw from him. The the important part is he's gotten better. That's what spring practice is for. And he, from what I saw early to what I saw in the spring game, I he looks he looks like he's improved quite a bit. So I was I was encouraged with what I saw from him. That's good. You know, and we've talked about it some like whenever guys get thrown into those spots that have been backups and haven't had those opportunities, it can be rough. But when you get that much rep, that many reps, that much coaching day in, day out, you're the walkthrough guy, you're out there getting all of it. And like that's you can see some massive growth pretty quickly. And and I'm glad to see Bates has, has shown exactly that. Uh, I think we was the best they got. Yeah. He continues to, he continues to play to uh, at a really high level swung and missed a couple times in the run game, ducking his head. That's just a technique thing. I think that easily co- correctable, like him coming off the ball aggressively thought he was really good in protection they ran that those couple couple of those stretch plays. He actually runs better than I thought he would. Now they ran the little. It was almost like a jet sweep to Petaway. That it, it was just outside zone is what it was. It was just a different guy getting the football. It wasn't a jet sweep that gets around the corner. It was the jet sweep that kind of stretches and hits and uh, ends up hitting in the B gap. And he he lost Sears on that one, but other than that. Thought he looked really solid. Tackle. They they played better than they practiced. I thought that they played better than they practiced. And of course, it's because you're not in the predictable situations you're in in practice. It's it's harder to play defensive line when you're not in inside run and you don't know that the team's gonna run the ball. Like there's that there's that variable that changes things dramatically, but Thought they were. I thought that the tackles, uh, speaking about Tarquin and, and Taylor, thought they were better in the run game than they were in pass protection. They just have some. There's some moments where you can just see their athletic limitations in pass protection. Yeah. But I thought they both were at their best when they were short setting, when they were taking kind of a flatter angle in their set, getting the starting the fight early, getting their hands on. When they did some of more of the drop back kind of vertical setting type stuff is when they struggled getting beat on their edge. But, and then, you know, Taylor gave up inside moves. Tarquin gave up inside moves. I, I think that I I still think you got to upgrade at the position, but I, I think both of those guys are guys you're comfortable playing. But I just think that if you can, and I'm not sure Sexton doesn't end up being your left tackle anyways. But I, I think that if you can, just like every other team out of, <laughs> in the country, you, I, I think they're going to take a serious look at trying to upgrade at that position. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. And, you know, you also are going to get Hatchet at some point. He'll be back, and he'll probably be an interior guy, right? Um you know, add some depth there on the interior, but yeah, I think you're, I think you're probably right. I just, I don't know how many of those guys are going to be out there. Yeah. I, I, I know this, if any of them are out there, they're going to be expensive. Yes, they are. So we'll, we'll see how that unfolds. One other thought. I thought that he throws Ida is a guy that I think is going to be a factor moving forward. His feet are just all over the place right now. And I don't know if that's a product of him being a little unsure what to do, but his feet in pass protection, uh, he, he was just setting himself up for failure. And a lot of the success that Grayson Halton had was against, you know, that second team offensive line. And he is retreating with his feet instead of playing with powerful feet in the ground where you're creating force through your feet. His flexion, at his knees and his ankles is all off. He is keeping his hips back and reaching forward. And you just have zero power when you play with your hips back like that. 
in the run game and pass protection, it doesn't. Your hips have to roll to produce power through your core, to produce power through the ground, to produce power through your legs. It, it's it's all a technique thing. I think he's got the physical tools. He just he's got to correct that. I didn't see that early in spring practice. And he was with the starting group. Now he's with the twos that can affect you a certain way mentally when you're a young lineman. But I'm here to tell you, I think the guy's got everything he needs physically. His technique is just all over the place right now. And it is significantly affecting his level of play. The good thing is it's easily correctable stuff. He did. He had some nice blocks in the run game when his technique was right. I like the I like the edge that the guy plays with, but you know he was the guy that had the key block on Hicks's long touchdown run. Mm -hmm. You know, does a nice job with the double team, seals the backer. Now the defense looked a little misaligned, but hey, it is what it is. But he just he's gotta he's gotta pay more attention to his technique because he's a guy that they're gonna need for depth. He may have to start a game or two, depending on how everything shakes out. So. It's it's just a technique thing. I, I was watching him really, really closely when I went back and watched the game and the feet and the angles of his lower body and, and the way that you know, he wasn't bringing his hips. It was just, you know, he's just setting himself up for failure, Ted. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think it's kind of what we've talked about there. It, it's going to be a, it's going to be a while before Bill finds the right five and where they're all going to play. Who knows? But I, I think they could put a, a solid group out there and they may add add a player or two out of the transfer portal to to try and upgrade the overall position. But overall, a good good place to be in spring game and they can build from there. I think I, I had multiple tweets who were like, hey, the offensive line's not nearly as bad as you guys made it seem. <laughs> They went out and they played pretty well. They played better than they practiced. They've gotten better. It, it, it's encouraging. That being said, you're always looking to upgrade the roster. Mm -hmm. Like the Branson Hickman kid from SMU. Yeah. Got to chat with him on the sideline. He was telling me about some of the other places he was considering. I expressed... I kind of chuckled. I was like, what are we even talking about, bro? When he mentioned the other couple places, I was like, what are we, what are we even talking about? <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see how all of that shakes out. Right. But uh, right now, these are the guys we got. And uh, I think the encouraging thing was that the group as a whole, from what I saw early in spring practice to what I saw on the field in the spring game, the group has, as a whole has improved. That's all you can ask for. Improvement. Let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys your number one takeaway from OU spring game. This first one comes from Shayna Hightower. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. She just says, no turnovers? Yeah. There's a question well, mark on the end. So is that like the defense didn't produce any turnovers? The offense, the offense didn't turn the ball over? No turnovers. That's right. Well, defensively, you know, you got to remember they play incredibly vanilla. You typically get your turnovers off of your uh, your chaotic plays whenever you're blitzing, whenever you're disguising things for the quarterback. Um, they didn't do a whole lot of that. They played it pretty, pretty straightforward. So it's not a big surprise that that they didn't force any and. You know, on the other side, running backs held on to the football and the quarterbacks were smart with it. You know, I, overall, I guess that's I guess that's what you want. Considering how they called the defense, I, it's not a surprise. It would almost be a, a massive disappointment if they did create turnovers. That is that's that's such a defensive guy way of looking at it. Fine. <laughs> uh, this other one comes from Adam Guthman who says running back and tight end spots still very questionable. I, I thought the running back position looked solid. Did, 
I didn't think anyone looked like Adrian Peterson out there for sure. Like, but right. were, were you disappointed? We, we talked about the tight end situation and maybe that not being great, but were you, were you underwhelmed by the running back spot? No, I thought the running back spot was good. I thought it was good. I wasn't blown away, but Sawchuck didn't play a whole heck of a lot. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was solid running back. And tight end, I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily the time to get into it, but I, we don't have a tight end. We have a fullback. Those guys aren't playing tight end. They, they're running lead and split zone and zone insert and counter. That's not a tight end. That's a fullback. And if you're going to have a full pack, put a fucking fullback in, is what I say. Not a tight end. I think it's stupid as shit, and I don't know why we do it. Everyone in college football does it. I think it's dumb, but that's just me. Like, if you're not – like, you're not creating a stress on the defense whenever you line that guy up in the backfield. You're making it easy on everyone in the front seven for the defense by putting a non-blocker – in a blocking spot and having him run that it's not you, the most you're going to do is run like split zone boot. And he's going to run to the flat. I mean, it, your stand up defensive end can cover that. I don't know why people do it. That's just, that's my little rant. And the other part of that is I'm not shocked when people don't want to come play tight end at Oklahoma because they don't want to be a fullback running ISO on the Mike backer. There he is. <laughs> the passion. I love it. I I think uh, people are going to be, be caught off guard by that. That was great. But you do you know what? Does that make sense, I, what I'm saying? Yeah. I, you and I have had many of these conversations when it comes to certain positions in this offense and being able to point to NFL concepts and say, hey, Look at this play. It's exactly what this NFL team runs. Like this, and I think tight end is one of the hardest positions to show those comparisons for with how this offense functions. But you I about I about passed out when they ran stretch because they never run it. And that is that is a concept you see every single Sunday. But yeah, you don't see a lot of zone insert in the National Football League. You just don't. If so you do, I, it's like the third team tight end is in. You know, it's not. Yeah, it's it's the blocking tight end role. Not it, it that that doesn't exactly scream. Hey, come here, catch forty balls and make plays. Catch fifty balls and make plays. Which that's. I mean, I, I don't know. It's clear as day to me, but I, I don't know. Oh, I think people definitely know you think it's clear as day now. <laughs> Potty mouth. That was like, that was. It so just makes me mad. I don't know how else to say it, I guess. I'm I'm sorry. No, I, I, I understand your frustration. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first. All you grill masters, listen up. Didier Ranch delivers premium quality beef that is 100% raised in Oklahoma right to your front door. Go to DidierRanch.com, D-I-D-I-E-R, Ranch.com to order one of their premium quality beef boxes and use promo code OKLAHOMA15 for 15% off your order. Filet, ribeye, New York strip, sirloin, steak burgers, they've got it all, and they ship anywhere in the continental U.S., and Oklahomans can get deliveries in just one to two days. The only thing better than having a lot of premium beef on the O and D line is having premium beef delivered right to your front door. Didier Ranch, tradition tastes better. And head to the garage for hand smashed patties, butter toasted buns, and some ice cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. And with all garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go to late night spot. Thunder Games. Go watch them at the garage. 8.30 tip-off. You kidding me? Garage is the perfect spot to watch them. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. 
As always, Ted, kick us off. You okay? You relax? I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Okay. I'm I just. I'm over I'm it. <laughs> we know it. We've got a fullback. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? OU baseball on a bit of a hot streak. They've won seven straight. They go out, sweep BYU. Uh, clear number one in the standings for the Big 12. It's their fourth conference sweep of the season. First time they've done it since the uh, since the Big 12 was formed. So that's a nice little run that they're on. And um, they've got uh, Texas coming to town this week for their for the Big 12 series. That's going to be a big one. But well, you baseball's in a pretty good spot right now. I think they're in the top 25 in in RPI, and the the conversation has been there's a chance that this team hosts a regional. I feel like that is always a massive deal. Yeah, when you are in that conversation, and is it? I want to say, I saw. Is it the first time they've ever swept that many Big Twelve series? Yeah, first time. Four, that is, four sweeps in the season. It's the first time since since they joined the, the conference. That's that's big time. I feel like every time we mention the baseball team, I have to mention how much I love Skip Johnson. Oh, he's the best. <laughs> he is he is the best. But yeah, uh, OU baseball, I, I know that there have been some rough patches, like some head scratchers throughout the season, but overall been a really solid team this year from what I can tell. Yep, they've got some good arms. Um, offense is there generating some runs. You know, they've they've found some depth. Spikerman's been out for a while, and you know the, the guy came and played center for him is really fast, incredibly fast. So they've got speed all over the baseball team. Guys are hitting. It's in a good spot right now. I like it. Love it. Who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Women's gymnastics. Ah. Oh. The shocker um, didn't make the final, uh, got knocked out in the semifinal round. Um, was was it, This team was really, really, really good, and it caught them all by surprise, and they just had a little bit of a letdown, not a little bit, a big letdown moment and couldn't crawl out of the hole from it. It was, uh, it was a shocker, to say the least. The announcers, I was watching, I watched the whole thing, the announcers were stunned after their vault rotation mm -hmm. because vault is kind of what, and you know, going a couple of weeks back, had a couple of the, the, the associate head coaches of the gymnastics team on, on the huddle and vault is kind of what makes them so much better than everyone else. Their ability to score on that event. And it just went, I just, they picked they picked a they picked the wrong day to have a bad day. Yeah. And they'd been next level all year in everything. They had been money. By far and away the best team in the country. So frustrating. I hate that for them. It is it's a reminder that gymnastics can be it can be cruel, man. If you if you mess one rotation up, you're kind of toast. Yeah, there's no like you can't you can't have like a dramatic for I mean you can, but if you if you have like a really bad one, like it could like the game's already over <laughs> type of situation. And, and credit to them for continuing to battle, but they had to have known yeah. that that quickly, that early that and that affects you the rest of the way too, for sure. They just messed it all up. But it, credit to KJ Kindler. Uh, they were interviewing her after, and she handled it with a ton of class. That was just an extremely uncharacteristic performance by them. And from what I can tell, the event that kind of separates them from the rest of the pack. So just yeah. uh, it was a bummer, man. It looked like they were destined for another title, but sports. Yeah. I did see the men made the final. They got third, um, which, you know, they've made the final every single year of Mark Williams' 25-year career, which is just 
like an absurd run. They're very good at gymnastics. Great program. I, I'm not worried about the women's program. Think they're going to bounce back nicely next season. If fun. I had to, yeah, if I had to make a prediction, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that KJ Kindler is going to have that group uh, in title contention again. Yeah, they'll be all right. All right, let's get to my winner and loser. But first, attention, business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. And head to opolisclothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. For my winner of the week, I thought about going with OU softball. TED finally made it out to Love's Field to watch a game after the spring game. That stadium is awesome. It is. It is. Place was packed. Uh, they run ruled Houston 10 to 2. Kind of some drama to get the last out to uh, complete the run rule. It, I, it was weird. There was some tension in the stadium about completing the run rule, which was kind of funny. S- I saw a clip. Someone posted a clip, clip on of Twitter of one of the Houston girls, I guess, hit the home run. Oh, it was a bat flip, my friend. Yeah, it's like interesting bat flip while you're in the middle of getting run ruled. <laughs> yeah, it was it was about as bat flippy as you could get. Now, to her credit, that thing it was, was a bomb. hammered. But yeah, interesting choice. I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm not the bat flip police. Bat bat flip away, everyone. I I I don't care. <laughs> but it's just a fantastic experience at that new stadium. Uh, crowd was great. It's loud. Like they built it, like it's it, it's it's loud. Like the, I, I love the amount of noise that's in there. That program, they they've just set the standard in every single way of the sport. Ted, it's just it was it was really really cool and always fun to watch them beat down an opponent, and run rule someone. I I had a really really good time. You think, uh, you know, they delayed the the statue situation. You think. Uh, Patty was happy about that, or is she like, let no, let's let's get this thing done and get it over with. <laughs> if I had to guess, I think Patty will pay someone to have that statue destroyed at some point. <laughs> I think she, I think she hates it, but it is what it is. Uh, it's a product of your success, Patty. Deal with it. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Stop doing so well, then, if you don't yeah, want a statue. No, but <laughs> she. She doesn't exactly like when the attention is all on her. So I imagine having a statue in front of the stadium is her worst nightmare, but just have to deal with it, coach. Sorry. That's funny. My winner of the weekend, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Woo. Ted, it seems like the Timberwolves may have heard all the people talking about how Phoenix is a bad matchup for them. You know, I had a lot of people saying that, Phoenix had handled them in the regular season, which was true. Uh, But a lot of people were saying Minnesota's not going to be able to play their double big lineups against Phoenix. You know, jump shooting's too good. Nas Reed and Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert. You're you're not going to be able to have all those guys on the floor. Well, all they did was just smack the hell out of Phoenix in game one. Yeah. Anthony Edwards went off in the third quarter and you know Durant was fantastic for Phoenix in this game. He he was not the issue, but it appears that Minnesota took all of that stuff personally. And they came out and proved a point, 25 point blowout in game 1 of that series and Ted, I think Anthony Edwards is your guy. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's your guy just He's got this great footwork. He was killing him in the mid-range. He was four of eight from three. 
but he was just talking so much trash, like hitting shots and yelling at Kevin Durant as they came back <laughs> down the floor. I don't know. He just, he seems like your kind of guy. I like that. I like it whenever you, as long as you can back it up. Yeah. And like, there's a fine line between obnoxious and like in the moment being in the game and, and feeling it, which I, I love that confidence. So yeah, keep it up. I'm all for it. Minnesota's huge, man. They just have, they have so much size. They made, they made Phoenix look small. And I, I don't think sometimes in a, in a series in the NBA, there's like the classic game one overreaction, right? I just don't see how Phoenix can beat them uh, unless Durant and Booker just go completely go off. And Booker didn't play particularly well in this game, but Minnesota just had, they've got so much size and now Grayson Allen rolled his ankle and, and, and went out. So Phoenix already felt really thin and now they feel even thinner. If he's not close to a hundred percent with the ankle, I, I don't know, man, it, I was really, really impressed with the way that Minnesota looked in, in that game. And that place was rocking. It seemed like that was an awesome atmosphere. Rudy Gobert had a massive effect on the game. It was, it could not have gone better for the Minnesota Timberwolves in game one of that series. You know, you probably get a better effort from Phoenix in game two. Or like they'll be really trying to steal one before they head, head back home. But, but, but the thing is, Durant was do? great. I know I'm not supposed to say positive things about him. His jump shooting in that game, I mean, he was on. Mm -hmm. And they lost by 25. That's a lot of ground to make up. Yeah. I mean, Durant was really, really good offensively. I mean, they had no answers for his pull-up jumper game. Like, and no one does. If he's making those shots, that is a wrap, man. There's no one on, on the face of the planet that can guard that. but. Yeah, he was that good, had 31, and the game wasn't close. Yeah. Well, so maybe Phoenix is who we who we thought they were. Maybe. I, and maybe it was a bad matchup for Phoenix. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess whenever you uh when a team can grab onto anything, they you know, that you you throw them something out there about how it's a bad matchup and they can go prove it, well then you know, that's always ends up being fun to watch. And I'm guessing that was probably the edge that Anthony Edwards had out there. No doubt. My loser of the weekend. Yeah, I watched Texas's spring game. What's up? When yours. Now, he only got two series in their spring game. But first one, batted ball, pick six. Not great. I mean, not, not, not how you would uh, get things going in the old spring game. But really... He's the loser of the weekend because Arch Manning came in there and lit it up, Ted. Yep. First pass, and the guy was wide open, but first pass is 75-yard touchdown. Okay, it is what it is. But if you go and watch all of his throws, I, I know there are some Arch haters out there. I, I know there are some people that believe his recruiting ranking was tied to his last name and all that. Like, I don't care. If you go and watch the guy throw the football and play from the pocket, he can play. He looked That's good. That's what I've seen. I, he looked good. I don't know. I, I haven't seen enough of him to to have a final final decision because it's all just kind of been like spring game stuff or mop up duty, whatever. But I like I like his footwork and I like his delivery and he throws. He's got he's got a good throws a really good ball, accurate ball plenty of zip it's got nice touch on it i i agree like it, he looks the part whenever he plays quarterback he had impressive calmness in the pocket that that's what really stood out to me and remember he was playing with the first team offensive line and they did a nice job protecting but when it felt like things were maybe closing in on him you just look at where his eyes are they're up he's not looking at the rush at all he was calm and did a really nice job stepping up into the space in the pocket and delivering accurate throws. I, 
I watched every single, someone put a clip of every single throw he had in the spring game together. And he only had one throw and it was to the transfer Matthew Golden down the sideline. He threw him a hospital ball would not have been good, <laughs> but unlike Boganowski, Texas's DB did not just absolutely destroy what he could have, but it was other than that throw hit a really nice day. I, I saw 19 to 25 for 355 and three touchdowns. He had one long one to Isaiah Bond, the kid for Bama that transferred, dropped it in the bucket perfectly. Uh, safety over the top safety was late. Just, I don't know, man. Ewers didn't exactly light it up last year. No, I, I've said it a million times. He's good, but he ain't great. He's, I mean, he's better than average, but he is, he is not, he is not one of, he's not anywhere close to where he's like ranked in like the Heisman and all of that stuff. He's just not that type of player. Solid, throws really nice ball when everything is good. He's got good pocket and, and they've, they've been running the ball. Well, he's a quarterback that, that does a good job for you, but he's not a good, you know, uh, when things get off schedule, he's not great. And, you know, he's just, he's, he's not a great athlete. And Manning's a better athlete. It's a weird thing to say that a Manning at quarterback is a better athlete than someone else on the field. But I don't know. No, it doesn't mean that they make the move because experience matters and, you know, all that. But it's one of those things that could drive the wedge. I mean, when you see it, you see it. I mean, the guys in the locker room aren't dumb. Steve Sarkeesian has to love this, and he has to hate it. Because <laughs> remember, Malik Murphy left for Duke. You you want to feel good about your quarterback depth. And they had another freshman that looked pretty dang solid as well. But there's no doubt after watching Arch perform the way that he did that he feels better about his quarterback situation. I mean, there's just no doubt. However... He was so good that this is going to linger over that program. I mean, it just is that it is going to be, it's going to be over that program the entire off season. I, I don't know if it's a distraction, but I guess if you're Steve Sarkeesian in a perfect world, when you sees that and goes, okay, I got to keep getting better. I got to keep improving and is extra motivated and you get the best version of Quinn yours in the fall. But Arch looked good, man. I, I don't know any how anyone could watch that and say he did it. Like even the biggest Arch Manning hater has to watch that and go, okay, yeah, he, he can he can do a little something. I I thought he looked what game, he came in in a game last year and and performed really well. It's like tech, maybe. I don't know. Is that what it was? Yeah. But that's really all we've seen of him in, in live action. And he he answered the call on that night. Maybe there's a situation brewing there. I I don't know. It just, I wonder who gives their offense the highest ceiling. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Well, here's how I'll say it. Whenever we play Texas, I hope Quinn Ewers is playing quarterback. I'm sure no one is going to take that and send it to Quinn Ewers. That's fine. Well, I mean, it's just we're a just a couple old has bids. They don't care what we think. It's not the and, and again, it's not that he's he's not he's not bad. He's just like he's he's not a, a like to me the 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 big difference between the two is I think that Manning and I I haven't seen a whole lot of him, but I think that he's he's better and he's more athletic when things get off schedule, and that to me is where Quinn Ewer struggles. This is the way. I think it, looking at Texas season last year, it, it, it's interesting. You got a possible first rounder at tight end in Jatavion Sanders. Xavier Worthy went and set the 40 record at the combine. Um, Adonai Mitchell, probably going to be another first rounder. Quinn Ewers threw for 22 touchdowns and six interceptions. And they had the best running back in the Big 12 for a stretch till he got hurt. He I mean, didn't exactly like when you take everything into account, he had weapons everywhere and didn't exactly light it up. Yeah. So it's 
I, I'm not saying this just because uh, Arch looks so good in the spring game. Like there's, there is a, there is a big case to be made that Quinn Ewers held that offense back a year ago. From what it yeah. could have been, and let's not forget, Steve Sarkeesian was one of the best play callers and play designers in football. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. It just with what last year was, how good Arch looked, and, and I know it's just a spring game, but it's an interesting situation in Austin. That's all I'm saying. No, I, I, I totally agree. We'll see. You know, again, like it's it's the backup quarterback deal where you often go in, you got a much better, a much more favorable condition to go in and play well, uh, you know, and the, everyone's always talking about, you don't get to see the backup quarterback out there against Alabama's first team D and, you know, all of that stuff. So backup quarterback always has a tendency to just generally look a little bit better, but I think there may be something to this one. Birthday shout outs. Happy 18th birthday to Jonathan J.D. Caffey. And happy birthday to Nick Armado. On that note, episode 415 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Wednesday. Just a reminder, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tell all your friends about it. People, th- believe it or not, there are still some OU fans that don't know this podcast what? exists. Tell them all to download, subscribe, like, do all the things that help us, please. Until next time, we appreciate y'all for listening. Do we always do, Oklahoma? Take care of each other.